these past two years, uh, something uh, maybe a, a little different. These past two years, something strange uh, has been happening to, to me. Um, about, about two years ago, uh, Nellie and I were at a store, and as she was making the purchase at the register, uh, she was finishing up that purchase, and as she was finishing up that purchase, I approached the counter uh, to retrieve her and to walk out. And as she finishes the purchase, I walk to get her, and as I'm turning away from the register, uh, the cashier uh, looks at me. We make eye contact. Uh, she smiles, and she says, Dave, right? Uh, I'm already kind of turning around. I'm already leaving the counter. My mind is already set on going. It catches me off guard. I don't know what to say back to her. And so I just smile and said, yeah. <laughs> and I leave. Right? Uh, a couple months later, again, I'm walking with Nelly, and we're at Stonebriar Mall. We're on the second floor of Stonebriar Mall. And as you know, if you've been there, uh, there's one side and the other side, and it's divided by the first floor. You can look down. As we were walking past Journeys, a shoe store, we're walking on the opposite side, maybe from me to the back of the sanctuary. And as we're walking and passing the store, I see one of the employees run out of the store and wave at us. Uh, not us, but me. And as the employee waves, they yell out from across the mall, Dave, what's up? I'm walking with Nellie, I just wave, not much, and I keep going. Right? Uh, in both instances, Nellie asked me, what is going on? I just shrug, I have no idea what is going on. A, a few months ago, without Nellie this time, I'm going into Walmart. As I go into Walmart, uh, I make eye contact. We lock eyes uh, with this gentleman uh, checking out at one of the registers. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. As we lock eyes, he smiles, he waves, I turn around, there's no one behind me. And again, Dave, how's it going? I wave back, I keep going into the store, like it's no big deal. Uh, given some thought, I, I think I finally figure out what has been going on. Uh, apparently there is another 6'2", broad-shouldered Chinese guy just roaming the streets of Plano, Named Dave. <laughs> Have you ever mistaken someone's identity? Has anyone ever mistaken your identity? Sure, we get names mixed up every now and again, but ever have you confused? Have you ever gotten mixed up who someone is? This morning, we're going to look at a very special case of mistaken identity, and we're going to see three things in particular. Have you ever mistaken someone's identity? Uh, called them something, but in fact, there's something else all together. The name, the title, the identity that you call them does not in fact match who they are. Uh, so this morning we're going to see three things in particular, who, why, and how. Who, why, and and how? Uh, who? Who do we need to be aware of misidentifying? Why? Why is it so important that we get this identity correct? And how? How do we make sure we don't misidentify and we properly identify those who do need to be identified? Uh, this morning, if you would please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. John 10 verses 1 through 10. Uh, you can find John in the New Testament towards the right-hand side of your Bibles. Matthew, Mark, Luke. You'll find John. John is just before Acts, Romans, Revelation. Uh, these past few weeks, we've been going through a seven-part series looking at the I Am statements of Jesus Christ throughout the book of John. Uh, Jesus gives these I Am statements and uses physical, tangible, relatable, earthly things to relay a spiritual reality. Uh, we saw three weeks ago, Jesus is the bread of life. He overcomes sin 
and death. He who eats of him will never thirst or hunger anymore. Uh, last week we saw in chapter 8, Jesus identifies himself as the light of the world. He shines the light on the darkness. He exposes sin and darkness of this world. It is through Jesus Christ that we know the standard of goodness, through Jesus Christ that we can be redeemed and restored into perfect relationship with God. Jesus, as the light of the world in chapter 8, there as he is teaching and preaching and healing in Jerusalem, in the temple, he exposes the darkness. In chapter 9, Jesus reiterates again, I am the light of the world. There is a man who is born blind. Jesus heals this blind man. And at the end of chapter 9, the blind man, the scriptures tell us, he believes and begins to worship Jesus. Jesus, as the light of the world, opens this man's eyes so he can see and believe. While Jesus reveals his light in chapter 9, he also exposes the darkness. While the blind man was born blind, physically could not see, Jesus opened his eyes, not only physically, but spiritually as well, to believe and worship Jesus. And this presents a foil with the Pharisees. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they had physical sight, but they're spiritually blinded in darkness. They could not see, and so they rejected Jesus Christ. It is in light of this rejection, in light of this exposure of light and dark, in light of these Pharisees, that Jesus makes the next I am statement in chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Uh, let us look at what Jesus says in verses 1 through 2, and let us identify who we must be very aware and who we must be careful of that we do not misidentify. Let's look at who. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. Of John. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus is speaking here, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Jesus is using the illustration of a shepherd and his flock of sheep, and he speaks of the sheepfold. Uh, the sheepfold is this uh, structure uh, that is heightened so the sheep cannot get out. And typically there is only one way in and out of the sheep fold. The sheep fold surrounds the sheep, keeps the sheep contained, keeps the sheep safe. And there is only one way in and out. And Jesus is saying, beware of whom? Beware of those who enter the sheep fold, not by the door, not by the entrance, but climb in and find illegitimate ways inside the sheep. Beware of those who enter by illegitimate means, who climb in by another way. Who are these people? Verse 1, that man is a thief and a robber. This contrasts with verse 2, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own, his sheep by name, and leads them out. So who is Jesus cautioning the people at that time of being aware of? Who has been misidentified, and who needs to be properly identified at this time? Uh, Jesus is cautioning the Jewish people, God's people of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, these are the thieves and robbers. These are those who have entered the sheepfold, not by the entrance, not by the door, but they have climbed in. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees were a specific sect of religious leaders, of Jews. What was their characteristic? They were revered. They were known for. They were looked up to. Their expectation was that they would study the law. They were fervent and zealous for the law of God. And so they would study the law, they would know the law of God, and they were known for keeping and obeying the law of God. What was the expectation of the Pharisees? The Pharisees, knowing God's law, knowing the law and the prophets, 
and obeying the law and the prophets, the expectation was that they would be the ones to direct, to guide, and to lead God's people towards God. That through their study of the scriptures, through their study of the law and the prophets, that when the day came that Jesus Christ arrived, the Messiah, their job would be to point out and say, according to the law and the prophets, this man, Jesus Christ, he is the Messiah that we've been all been waiting for. Everybody go and follow him. Everybody go and worship Jesus, the Messiah. But instead, why are they thieves? Why are they robbers who come in to steal and take away? They've been sorely misidentified. These people have been following the Pharisees, expecting them to lead them towards God. But in fact, they're following the Pharisees. And as the Pharisees reject Jesus Christ, so do the people. Who do we need to be aware of and cautioned of misidentifying today? Just as in the past, The Jews need to be aware of the Pharisees, the thieves, and the robbers. Just as the early church had to be aware of thieves and robbers, false teachers within the church, so too today we must be aware and properly identify the thieves and the robbers. Not those outside the church, but more particularly those who profess and those who claim to be within the church. There are thieves and robbers, those who we look to as teachers, as leaders, as pastors, those as we look to who are being trained in God's word, those whom we're following, who are guiding, our small group leaders, those who have influence and that we are following, but have we identified them appropriately? Or are they misidentified as shepherds? Who are you following? Who do you look for as a spiritual guide in your family, in the church? Who have you identified as one to model your life after? Who have you identified as one who is trustworthy? Who have you identified to seek counsel after? Who have you identified to follow? Why? Why is this so important? that we do not misidentify, and that we properly identify. Uh, To see why this is so important, we'll skip ahead to chapter 10, verse 10. Uh, We'll fill in the gaps next. Uh, Verse 10 tells us why it is so important that we do not misidentify who the thief, the robber is, and who the shepherd. Verse 10 says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why is it so critical? Why is it so important that we make sure we know who we're following and we make sure we know who is the thief, who is the robber, and who is the shepherd? Verse 10, again, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus Christ says that he is the shepherd, that he comes so that all may have life and have it abundantly. Why is it so critical we do not misidentify the thief from the shepherd? Um, my wife Nellie is, is a little directionally challenged, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll stand, oh, okay, maybe you shouldn't go there. All right, I'll turn this way. So, uh, no shame in that. You know, it's, uh, it's, a big, it's a big world out there, guys. Uh, and... Um, oftentimes, um, I'll get a phone call when I'm at home because uh, my commute's very short. Uh, I live about two miles away. And she'll call me, and she'll just frantically, she'll ask me, Brian, where am I? Uh, I don't know. What do you see? Right? So I just say, identify some land markers, uh, find a police station. I don't know. Right? What do you see? Uh, shoot a flare. I'll look for you. Whatever it might be. All right. Uh, my commute is about two miles away. Uh, it takes less than five minutes to get to church, uh, to get back. Um, full disclosure, one morning, uh, I woke up Sunday morning at 9.15, and I still got here on time, right? Um, Nellie's commute uh, is to Fort Worth, and so it's one way is 55 miles. And so that means 
there are 55 miles of opportunity to get lost one way in the morning, and there are 55 miles of opportunity to get lost one way coming back in the afternoon or even late at night, depending on what time uh, she leaves. Uh, but thank goodness for Google Maps. Thank goodness for uh, GPS. I have not gotten those calls uh, recently. So the way GPS works is it's a global positioning system. It helps and identifies and attracts where you're going, how fast you're going, the direction that you're heading in. Uh, there's 24 satellites that are orbiting the planet in this system. And in order for you to track where you are going, you need to communicate and lock in with at least three satellites. That way they can triangulate your position and figure out where you are exactly here on God's green earth. Four satellites can help identify your altitude and how high or low you are. But as you set your GPS and as you're following your GPS, these satellites with your phone, with your GPS, is communicating nonstop. As you're traveling 30, 40, 50 miles local, 60, 70, 80, 90 miles highway, nonstop, every inch of the way, every millimeter, every step that you go, your position is being checked and rechecked hundreds, if not thousands of times, over and over again, not by one satellite, not by two, not by three, but by a ton of satellites checking and rechecking your position. And why is it so important that your position is checked, rechecked over and over again? Because heaven forbid you miss your turn and you lose a few seconds and have to make a U-turn to correct your path. Why is it so important that we check and recheck who we are identifying or misidentifying as thieves or shepherds. It is so important, it is so critical because the consequences are how high? How high are the stakes? Chapter 10, verse 10 again. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Following the thief and the robber leads to death. Following the shepherd, Jesus Christ, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why is it so important that we properly identify? Because the consequences are a matter of life and death. You check and recheck so you don't miss a turn that will cost you a few seconds and you can return to correct that path. But brothers and sisters, when was the last time you checked who you were following? Were you going the right path? When was the last time you checked whether or not you're making a wrong turn that wasn't going to cost you a few seconds but when was the last time you checked if you were making a wrong turn that was going to cost you all of eternity? And once you die, there is no U-turn. There is no turning back to correct the path. When I leave my house each morning, I hope and I pray none of my neighbors are watching because what they'll see is me take out my keys Lock, unlock, lock, unlock, lock, unlock. I'll walk to my car, and I'll think, let's check again. <laughs> I'll go back, I'll lock, unlock, lock, unlock. When I lock the doors of the church, I'll go around, lock, unlock. That's why, sorry, building committee, locks are all worn out. Lock, unlock, right? I'll check and I'll recheck these mundane things. You've been taught, check, recheck your homework, your tests, put your name on it. Check, recheck. Those of you at work, you've got a checklist of things to do. Check, recheck. Before you hit send on that silly email, you check and recheck your tone, your language. You check and recheck. Who am I sending it to? You check and recheck things of small or maybe of quite significance. 
But when was the last time we checked and rechecked the things of eternal consequence? When was the last time you checked and rechecked things that once you die cannot be undone? Good morning. My name is Dave. It's good to be with you. What is your name? Who are you? Who are you following? Have you been misidentified? And have you misidentified who you are following? For our leaders here this morning, for myself included, whether you have a title here at PCAC, or perhaps you're a leader, who's your husband, your father, your man of the house, perhaps you're a leader, because your upperclassmen welcoming in the sixth graders. Perhaps you're a leader because you proclaim to be salt and light, because you proclaim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. But the question this morning is, have you been misidentified? As you seek to be salt and light in this world, as you give your testimony, tell others, hey, Follow my example. Follow my witness and testimony. Are you leading them to eternal life? Or are you a thief, a robber that steals and destroys? For you and your personal life, for your family, who are you following? For those that you look up to, you seek counsel in, for those who you're listening to instruction from, your small group leaders, in your homes, your teachers, have you misidentified the shepherd when in fact you're following the thief? Why is it so important that we not misidentify who we follow? Because the consequence is of eternal significance. Lastly, how then? How do we make sure we do not follow the thief, the robber? How do we make sure we identify correctly? And how do we make sure we properly identify the shepherd? Come back next week. No kidding. We'll find out right now. So how do we do this? Uh, let's look and fill in the gaps there in verses 3 uh, through 9. Uh, but as we do that, we'll go ahead and go back to verses 1 and two. So John chapter 10, let's start with one and two. Again, thinking again, who are we making sure we properly identify? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. How do we identify and follow the shepherd? We identify and follow the shepherd, Jesus Christ. He calls, and we follow by first knowing his voice, and secondly, then we follow and obey that voice. As we follow and obey the shepherd, we are simultaneously doing one more thing. Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. In order to identify the shepherd, we must know his voice, and we must then obey that voice while simultaneously fleeing from the thief, fleeing from sin towards righteousness. Moving on, verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus moves this illustration one step further, and here he states, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the way through which the sheep enter the pasture into paradise. Jesus is the way through which we have eternal life. It is through Christ that we are saved. Who are you following? In order to properly identify the shepherd from the thief, the shepherd calls out to his sheep. This ancient Near Eastern culture, the shepherds would name each of their sheep individually. And not only that, what would happen after that? I name a lot of things, right? Uh, I have many names for many of you. Uh, secretly on my phone that you don't know. No, okay. I have many names. Call my dog. Tons of things he doesn't answer, right? The shepherd has not only named his sheep, but what is the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd? When the shepherd calls, the sheep know his voice and they follow. How do the sheep know the shepherd's voice? In order for the sheep to know the shepherd's voice, the sheep must know his word. In order for us to follow the shepherd and not the thief, in order for us to identify who the shepherd is and who the thieves are, we must do this one thing and it'll take care of both sides. Make sure, double-check, you are following the shepherd. Uh, Growing up in Florida, we had a pool in the backyard, um, and every summer, we spent every day of summer swimming. And as we swam, my mother spent every day of her summer watching us swim. And she would sit in a lawn chair outside of the pool, and she would have an umbrella like every good Asian mother would, to protect herself uh, lest she get tanned or something horrible like that. And as she sat with the umbrella, she would start coaching my brother and I. As we swam, she would say, stop messing around. Kick harder. Swim this way. Swim that way. Rotate your arm more. Why are you cupping your hands like that? Tiger mommy are fun time, all right? As we swam, she'd coach, she'd teach us, and we felt safe as my mother watched over us. Uh, When my brother and I were teenagers, we saw something that we can't unsee. We saw and we were shocked as we watched for the first time my mother get in the pool. Uh, We were shocked because as she got in the pool, She was all nervous. We were shocked as she got in the pool. With one hand, she held onto my father's shoulder, hanging off for dear life, digging into his flesh. And with the other hand, holding on to the side. We were shocked as we watched my father tell my mother to hold the side of the pool and teach her how to kick. We were shocked as we watch my mother go prone on her back and learn how to just wade and float and use her buoyancy. We were shocked because my mother does not know how to swim. Don't learn to swim from someone who doesn't know how to swim. This weekend, our Labor Day weekend, our retreat, we had Pastor Travis come in yesterday, and our focus has been on the idea of Christian biblical community. That as we come together, as we congregate together, we are to spur one another on. We are to encourage, we are to engage one another. But the key factor is, this isn't just any grouping of people. Biblical Christian community 
isn't just another hangout club. Biblical Christian community isn't just another group of people. And you said, hey, we're biblical Christian community. I don't just go to a restaurant and when I see a crowd, I hop in there. I say, hey, biblical Christian community. I don't go to the theater. I look around at all the people sitting with me. I say, hey, biblical Christian community. I get on a plane. I don't say, hey, biblical Christian community. I get in a taxi cab. I don't say when two or more are gathered. No. Biblical Christian community are those who know how to swim, swim together. And those who do not know how to swim are also following those who do know how to swim to swim together. To identify whether or not you are following the thief or the shepherd, who are you seeking counsel after? As you wrestle with sin, as you wrestle with the things and temptations of this world, as you wrestle with how to be obedient to the scriptures, it is good to be in community. It is good to seek the counsel of others. But who are you asking for that counsel? As you're wrestling to obey the scriptures, you ask somebody, hey, help me out. How do I follow the scriptures? Are they a thief or a robber? Well, are they following the scriptures themselves? In your conversations, is it just conversation about what I feel like, what I think you should do? Or when you come with problems and concerns and worries, even in daily Bible study talking together, do you say, wait, 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 this is how I feel, this is what I think, but more importantly, what is God's word? Do we know the voice of the shepherd? And do we follow? For you, in your walk, as others are discipling and pouring into you, as you are making disciples of all nations and discipling others and pouring into others, are you a thief or a shepherd? Do not rely on your own skill, your own power, your own merit. Do not rely on your own knowledge. Do not rely on your own emotions. Do not rely on oh, your own what you think. But make sure that what you guide, what you teach, what you share with others in community begins and ends with God's voice so that you can recognize the shepherd and follow him. Have you ever had a case of mistaken identity? If you ever see me around Plano, or somewhere else, and you call out, hey, Brian, and I ignore you, it's probably because you have found Dave. <laughs> and when that day comes, take a picture, call me. I will be there to meet him. Have you ever been misidentified? Who in your life are you misidentifying? It is so critical because it is a matter of life and death. It is of eternal consequence. How do we make sure we don't misidentify the thief from the sheep, the shepherd from the thief? Know his voice. Study, obey, and teach the scriptures. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for this time that we can spend the hearing, the preaching of your word, that we may be encouraged and receive exhortation, to receive direction from your word. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you convict our hearts of sin and righteousness, that you reveal to us right now how we are to be obedient to you and where we are lacking. In light of the scriptures, let's take a moment to reflect. Let's take a moment to check, to recheck, and to check again. 
Which direction are you going? As you take turns and twists, as you change direction, as you make decisions big and small, as you make decisions about what words to speak and how to say them, as you make decisions about the attitude with which you will work and study, as you make decisions about your family, how you will raise them, how you will lead them, how you will guide them, as you make decisions here at PCAC of joining community, of how to be involved, of how to love and to care, of how to shepherd others, let us check, recheck, and check again. Who are you following? Who are you modeling your life after? When the rubber hits the road, when things get tough, when there's a decision to be made, when you need counsel, who's that person that you call? Who's that person that you text? Where do you search for answers? To a moment then to check, is that person leading me toward the shepherd Jesus Christ? Or away? Are your conversations, are your counsel rooted in the world, rooted in your feelings, rooted in your emotions, rooted in what your heart wants at that time? But as scriptures teach us, the heart is wicked and not to be trusted. We cannot trust in ourselves. We cannot rely on ourselves. But is the one we're looking towards rooted in God's word? Are we being taught to know his voice so we can follow and obey him? Let's take a moment to think about our role as those who are discipling others. Let's take a moment to reflect on our role as those who are teaching and leading and guiding in our homes, our workplaces, making witnesses and being a witness of Jesus Christ. Are you being a thief that leads to destruction? Are you shepherding under the shepherd, Jesus Christ? How in your life can you adjust that? How critical it is to spend more time in God's word each and every day to know his voice so he can share his voice with others. How can you be more rooted in the scriptures? How can you incorporate daily God's word? How can you quote scriptures in your conversations? How can you think of passages and stories as reference, as a foundation to guide you each and everywhere you go? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let us stand and respond and continue worship this morning. <clears throat>